Part of me believes that he he kind of martyred himself. I think my ancestors who who told these stories understood that you can tell people what not to do. You can tell them, don't do this, don't do that. They knew that people, if you tell them that, they're just going to go harder at it. They're going to go, why? But if you tell a story where there's a, a character in there who means to do well, but then all of a sudden gets sidetracked by his little trickster ways and goes and does it anyway, and you see what he what happens to him, and you see the consequences, especially the consequences to his behavior. If you're put with that decision in front of you, and you go, geez, I remember in that one story, Coyote was right here in this right place at the right time that I'm in right now. When he went forward and did what he wanted to do and made his choice, this is what happened to him. This was his consequence. And it makes you go, do I really want to face that consequence? Hello, I'm Tom Hack. And this is my podcast about the ancient art of storytelling. Here we discuss the origins and evolution of stories through ancient mythology, legends, and oral traditions. Because every story has a story. In the next three episodes, I talk with teacher, educator, and knowledge sharer, Kenton Thomas. He wears a Celtics cap that covers up his black hair, but we can forgive him for being a Boston fan. After all, he suffered through the Vancouver Grizzly years. Kenton looks like he has stories stored in his cheeks just waiting to be told. He has a big smile that he shares generously, and he's a captivating storyteller. I think you're really going to like hearing from him. I know I did. My name is Kenton Thomas. I'm a Sequakmik from the Sequakmik I was born in Kamloops, British Columbia, raised in uh, the Switzmoth area known as Salmon Arm, British Columbia. And uh, my kia'as are uh, Dr. Mary Thomas, Vera Johnny. My, my sla'as are pa'as are Mark Thomas and Herbie Johnny. My parents are Phyllis and Jerry Thomas. And I have a, I have a biological son. His name is Susep Sewell, beautiful boy. And uh, I have a, a partner, her name is Melissa, and she has two beautiful children named Tristan and Lexus. I do the protocols in that way to explain that the knowledge that I, I have today was given to me by the ancestors. And the knowledge that I'm sharing today belongs to the Kalmuch, the people that are yet to come, the Lexuses, the Tristans, the Suseps. They're the ones who truly own the information. I'm just a keeper slash sharer. So that's why I do the protocols, is to in, ensure and, and to let you know that that's who I am and what I'm doing here today. He has his own protocol. You know this is a professional. I appreciate that reflection of his loved ones and the people that support him. I should take a moment for my own protocol and thank Kenton for coming out to share some time and discuss the art of stories. My first question for him was how did he get involved in storytelling? Theater. Theater was the first thing that I took on. I uh, did some theater in high school. And then uh, this lady came around from Toronto, and I'll acknowledge her as Abby Smythe. And she, uh, she wasn't Indigenous. She was non-Native. She was actually, uh, she had uh, English roots. And uh, she came around with this fellow by the name of Ron Mitus, and he was an Anishinaabe. And they came around in this little Toyota van, and they, they, they pulled up to the reserve, and they... They said they wanted to do some indigenous stories and storytelling in the form of a form of a play. So they approached me and my cousin Lyle, Lyle Thomas from Tecumlips. Because we are known to have done theater throughout high school and we, we were in a couple of plays and we, and Lyle I think even had a had a major role in a couple of them. And uh, we 
met with them and we said sure sure and they said they'd pay us for the summer and we went out and we did a a couple of stories in the play but we ended up doing jumping mouse which is a story from back east somewhere the prairie somewhere but we did bear and coyote mcdane night and we did uh the story of muskrat and we did a couple other stories and that kind of is what culminated and, and began, you know, that was the epicenter of our storytelling careers. We, we, we didn't know the significance of stories at the time. We just thought a story was a story. We didn't realize the history behind it. No one ever taught us about like the importance of stories and, and why they, why they were so uh, integral to our, to our history and to our, to our language and to our laws and to our, our, our indigeneity. So, we, we just did these stories and we had fun with them. And the thing is, is that what kind of really broke ground, I think, was that we, we played with the stories. We didn't keep them on the same track. We didn't keep them verbatim as, as James Tate would have wrote, rewrote them. James Tate being the Scottish guy from, uh, from uh, Savannah who is married to the Sequakmuk lady. And uh, we didn't take it word for word whenever we would uh, take a story and say, we're going to tell this one at the next event. Me and my cousin Lyle went through it, went to it together for probably about three, four years after doing plays at certain events. Then he got a family and a life and I I carried on because I was still just working in construction and I would try and get days off wherever I could. And this was one of the good ways, like I had a cultural event to go to. So they'd say, oh, okay, Ma, we understand. So I would go out and I would do, do these stories. And mostly at the time, still not knowing the importance of the stories and passing the stories and the knowledge along, I used them as a tool to get out of work, to go to an event and to have some fun and to meet people and to hang out and not pound nails. So uh, I would go to these events and share these stories and I would do them through the characters that were in the stories. I would bring the, try to bring the characters alive and to really show them what I think my, my portrayal of a muskrat might be, what my portrayal of a, of a skunk might be, what my portrayal of a suckerfish might be, what, my char- what I think coyote looks like in my mind's eye. And I would try to bring them to life like that. And, you know, I didn't think that I was doing wrong but I also didn't think that I was doing anything right either but after a while people started grabbing onto it and grabbing onto it and I ended up after a while working with this company called Synclip Native Theater and they were already in the process of doing this about 10 years before I even started they they were they were well into it they had they they were traveling all up and down the west coast uh they had this fellow by the name of Richard Knorris, and I know I'm name dropping here, but these are all important people that played a part, big part in informing me as a teacher, as an educator, as a, as a knowledge share, as a storyteller. Um, Richard Knorris was playing coyote for them. And when I went to go work for them and I watched them play what they call their sink leap, I, I, I was just enthralled. I couldn't believe how well he did it, how well he, he, he moved and how well he, he, he brought life to the character of Coyote. And after a while, he started telling me it wasn't because he had a really good portrayal of who Coyote was and who he believed Coyote was. It was because the language taught him what Coyote should look like, the language of the Okanagan, the Sioux people. And... I watched him move and I was like, wow, holy smokes. And I, I, he, was a, he was a mentor to me for a long time and I watched him. And I, I, when I started doing coyote, I started finding my mannerisms more like him and I started listening to his teachings and his guidance. And I brought a whole different perspective and, and not only with the acting skills that they taught me there at, at St. Clip Native Theater, but also with just how much knowledge they had on on the language and the the stories and the laws and everything that surrounded the acting. And then when when Senclip Native Theater finally fell through, I moved on and I, I went to I went to other jobs and it just carried through. And then one day I decided to become a teacher and I went to UBC and then as a teacher, it just brought me to a whole nother level of uh, storytelling because 
I started understanding storytelling to be the step tikwa, the the legends that teach. I started understanding the stories to be so much more than just stories. You know, if you really listen to them, you can really bring a life to them. You can really bring the words of our ancestors to life. You you realize how intelligent our ancestors were. You realize even though they didn't have the technology and they were looked down upon as um, as heathens and as, as uh, you know, less than, their intelligence level and their connectivity, their interconnectivity, their, their abilities to, to see things and feel things, especially feel things that others can't feel or see, you can see them come to life in these stories that they tell. I tell this one story about how Coyote made a tree fall in love with him. And in that story, it talks about the breath that the trees share with us and we share the breath with them. And I ask the students who I work with, I go, how do you think they, they understand? How, how do you think they understood that we shared oxygen and carbon dioxide? And uh, all the kids, you know, they, they, they have really good answers, but there was this one kid in Tecumlips when I worked there for SD73, he said, I think your ancestors were just so connected to Mother Earth. And that's what I always believed, that they were so connected. They were so in tune with everything around them that they didn't need the technology that we have today. They just understood. They just understood and had a belief that this is what was happening, that this is what we knew. It was our ways of knowing and being. So that's pretty much a little beyond of how I got into storytelling, but that's how I got into it and why I'm sticking with it. James Tate was an anthropologist from the early 1900s. He studied the interior Salish First Nations. Tate was a colleague of Franz Boas. If you've studied anthropology in North America, you've read papers from Franz Boas. He's regarded as the father of modern anthropology. He's credited with being the first scientist to publish the idea that all people are equal. His research indicated that racial inequality is not biological, but originates in our social upbringings. He believed people could use the values of science over patriotism, nationality, and ethnicity, and call institutions to account for systemic racism. In 1963, Thomas Gossett wrote, it's possible that Boas did more to combat race prejudice than any other person in history. I like Franz Boas. He was the first to incorporate the scientific method to cultural anthropology. He felt that culture was fluid and dynamic. He taught his students that fieldwork required spending a long time among the people being researched. The research should be conducted in the native language, and native researchers should be collaborated with as a method of collecting data. He fought for cultural relativism in that the norms and values of one culture should not be evaluated using the norms and values of another. He knew he may not understand the significance of what had been said and done, or even what was significant and what was not. Boas was immensely influential in the development of studying folklore as a discipline. He introduced the scientific method of exhaustive research, fieldwork, and scientific guidelines in folklore scholarship. He believed that the similarity of folk tales amongst different groups was due to dissemination, and he used oral traditions to try and track the ancient movements of people. Boas made it his mission to collect as many texts as possible from Northwest Coast communities. In doing so, he often recorded stories told from a single native collaborator. With this technique, he was able to provide a stunning body of work. And while there are some issues with his strategies, his efforts to record stories in their native language is still paying dividends today. Boaz understood that stories have different meanings in different languages and took every effort to record oral traditions in the languages they were told. A recognized downfall is that he often only had one version of the story. Boaz was eager to analyze the content of the story. But First Nations peoples present an individual style and variation in the telling of the stories. One version of an oral tradition may only represent an individual and not the community as a whole. As an example, 
Similar versions of coyote stories have had different meanings emerge depending on the narrative skill of the storyteller. Reading a story is a lot different than performing a story. Some oral traditions are only entrusted to a particular family and handed down from generation to generation. So while his collection of information wasn't perfect, his work is still being used today and is helping to bring back native languages that were almost lost through the dark years of the residential school systems. As colleagues, Franz Boas and James Tate collected and published massive volumes of text on the interior Salish peoples. Tate was a political advocate for the First Nations of Canada and made many contributions towards native ethnology. If you would like to learn more about the stories mentioned in this podcast, I recommend James Tate's Mythology of the Thompson Indians. But due to their belief that culture is fluid and dynamic, I like to think that Boaz and Tate would both agree to updating the title of the book to Mythology of the Interior Salish First Nations. Enjoy the stories. How do you feel those stories have been translated through James Tate and Franz Boaz? Well, one thing my uncle, my, my uncle, he lived in Savannah. His name is Joe. He, he passed away last year. And one thing he told me is that we read it together one day and we were sitting there reading it and we were laughing about like some of the English that they use. And they're like when Coyote meets someone, he goes, hello there, sir. And I go, do you think Coyote ever said sir? And he, he laughed and he said, Kenny, you have to understand who his audience was. And I thought about that for a long time and I said, yes. He's writing to his audience. He's not writing to us. He's not writing our stories back to us. So when someone told him a story, he would take that story and he would write to his audience. And he understood that the story wouldn't translate in a true way. It would translate in such a way that his audience would understand. And I, I, I thought about that for a long time, and I said, well, all you have to do is re-engineer his words and think about what Coyote truly would say when he met someone walking down a path. He met the, the grouse up in the mountain cliffs, and he, he wouldn't go, hello there, sir. He would go, hey, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you trying to scare me? Why are you trying to push rocks on me? I'm Coyote, send clip, see clap, see clap, and sometimes send hokolo don't you dare. And he would say something like that. He would go off on him and he would talk too much and he'd fill up the air with all his words. There's a saying about coyote. We say we had Gal Gupke gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, but coyote, he doesn't realize he has two ears. He thinks he has two mouths. So he spits out as many words as he can all at once. And that's what I think he would do. He'd fill up that air, that space with all the words that he could. And he would tell him, everything that he, w- he would be able to about himself because they were trying to kill him. <laughs> so I think what James Tate and Franz Boas did was, was a beautiful thing. And I think they, in some ways, they had it right because of the whole kill the Indian and kill the Indian within the child and the residential schools and all that. Maybe they, maybe they foresaw into the future and they knew what was about to come down for us indigenous folk. And if they didn't kill us completely, like a complete genocide, then they were definitely going to try and kill our culture, our traditions, our ways of knowing and being. So by them preserving at least part, you know, part of, part of our, our stories, our legends, our shtabdikwa, they, they in turn gave us the opportunity to read them and to envision in our mind's eye what our ancestors might have been thinking, what our ancestors might have been saying, what our ancestors were truly, truly, what their belief or values might have been in their heart when they told these stories and what they, what they were trying to teach and put forth to the, to the next generation, to the, to the true owners of the, the stories, the Tagalmukh, the people that are yet to come. They're the ones that own the story. So whatever they were trying to tell them, you could kind of see it in some of uh, James Tate's writing and his words. So I, I, I read them, and I take the words of my Uncle Joe, and I, I take that little bit of knowledge that he shared with me about the audience. Well, who's the audience he was writing to, and who's your audience? And how do, you, how do you bring that together and interweave them? 
so that neither one is really diminishing the other. You're still using the words that James Tate used as your base, but you're using what knowledge you have of your own of your own self, your own indigeneity, what you know about your family, your friends, what you know about the reserve, what you know about people that are the other indigenous people in your life and how you can put humor and how you can put yourself and your whatever it is that makes you indigenous into this story and and burst it out in front of an audience so that they can look at it and they can relate they it has relevance to them it has uh it has it has something that makes them look at it and laugh and go geez that was real good holy and then at the end of the day at the end of the day it becomes ours again because we're the ones retelling and telling the story again yeah that's incredible it's so true isn't it too that you really get one side of a story when you read it yeah and especially when it's been written down by someone who doesn't have the familiarity that the language exactly like you say the expression for it the the voice of the coyote yeah and when they write it down in words it's it's it becomes you know almost one-dimensional until you get a, a storyteller who can explain it and express it and fills in all those that blank space, that white space, and that character behind it. Yeah, I like to call it found in translation because <laughs> it's kind of almost lost in translation the other way, and then it's found in translation back back when we get it. We 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 translate it back and we 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 bring it back in a good and kind way. That's and a great take. Yeah, yeah. Did you have anyone, like, were your parents, grandparents, was was anyone in your family a storyteller? I like to say that all of us are, are storytellers. Like, we all tell our stories in very, very different ways. Like, my dad, he likes to tell us stories through his basketry. He likes to do baskets, and he likes to uh, do art with birch. And then there's my mother. She likes to she likes to help with the baskets, but she also likes to write. And she used to, I think, at one time, do drawings. And my uh, yeah, Dr. Mary Thomas, she used to tell stories, but she she did her work through her hands. I always think about her hands whenever I think of my Kia, Dr. Mary Thomas. I never got to meet Mark, and I don't know too much about my uh, my grandpa, my my Slaa Mark. But I heard my 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 other Slaa Herbie knew how to play almost every instrument other than a piano and. But he knew how to play drums. He, he just didn't know how to play piano. He could play a fiddle. He could play a, um, all of the brass. He could play almost everything that, that was put in front of him. He could play it really well. And my, my other, my other Kia, uh, Bira, I heard she was a, a storyteller as well. I'd never had the opportunity to meet them in person other than Vera just before she passed away. But I was only a baby then. I think we're all storytellers in our very own different way. My son, for instance, he's a, he's a really, really, really good singer. And I think he will one day eventually start storytelling and start sharing his art through his, his body and acting. He did take an acting program down in Vancouver for a little while, but he's uh, since returned home. He hasn't done any acting since he returned home, but I think uh, one day he'll, he'll bring that. And he has he definitely has the character for it alongside of his singing skills holy man he would bring these stories to life in so many different ways that I couldn't so uh yeah I think we're all storytellers even even if we don't think it or know it or believe it I think every single one of us not just us as indigenous but all of us as a, as a human as a Kalmuk as a people we all our storytellers in our own very very different ways and that's what makes it so unique and so awesome is that sometimes I sit back and someone says I'm not a storyteller oh I don't want to tell a story and then I see them doing some art and I'm like what what is that and then they go oh it's just a picture you're telling a story and the, the student looks up at me and they go oh oh and then they go oh really and they're like yeah you're you're a storyteller you, you're telling a story through your through your picture through your painting through your drawing and then they they take such pride in it after that because it's so much more than just doing a picture uh singing a song um 
you know, rhyming words, uh, whatever else, you, whatever kind of other art you can think of. It's all dancing. Dancing tells a story. And uh, we all we all share our stories in very, very different ways. So I think, yeah, all of my ancestors were probably storytellers in some ways, even if they even if they don't think they were, they probably were in some way. There's quite a few famous coyote stories. How would you describe coyote? I know I see him in many, many different ways. Like, obviously, the most common trait he has is the trickster. But being him and playing him and, and, and reading about him and seeing him in action and just trying to walk in his shoes for so long, like almost 20 plus years now, part of me believes that he, he kind of martyred himself. I think my ancestors who, who told these stories understood that you can tell people what not to do. You can tell them, don't do this, don't do that, stay away from there, don't go over there, don't, you know, stop. But they knew that people, if you tell them that, they're just going to go harder at it. They're going to go, why? Oh, well, I don't really have a reason why. But if you tell a story where there's a, a character in there who means to do well, but then all of a sudden gets sidetracked by his little trickster ways and goes and does it anyway, and you see what, he, what happens to him, and you see the consequences, especially the consequences to his behavior. If you're put with that decision in front of you, and you go, geez, I remember in that one story, Coyote was right here in this right place at the right time that I'm in right now. When he went forward and did what he wanted to do and made his choice, this is what happened to him. This was his consequence. And it makes you go, geez, do I really want to face that consequence? It might not happen, but if it does, am I ready to face those consequences and to to make things right with everyone around me that I hurt because of those choices. So I think my ancestors who told these stories were so brilliant, so ingenious, that they knew that telling people to do something or don't do something, they're going to go ahead and do it anyway. But if you give them the choice, it'll make them think, do I want to make that same choice? You know, the most logical person will go, geez, I saw this choice made before. Am I going to make that same one or am I not? Am I going to go left instead of right? Left is the good choice. Right is the coyote choice. I'm going to go with the good choice today. But it's always good to see when someone does take the coyote choice because, boy, it sure goes through the moccasin trail really quick. <laughs> And then you hear about so-and-so down the next res and you go, oh boy, Coyote must have got him last night because he did what Coyote would have done. And then we all laugh about it. But but boy, yeah, I think about even some of today's best writers, I don't think could have came up with with that kind of perspective to to a character like Coyote and to keep him keep perpetuating him in that manner for so many stories story after story after story and to me that's why he's the martyr like if he was a real to truth animal person i would think he he would have looked up in one day and he would have said you know what most of these kalmuk they're not very bright they're they're clumsy they're awkward they can't fly they can't swim very well they run kind of funny they're weak and pitiful so the only way that they're going to learn something is by consequences. They're not going to learn by you telling them how this is what's going to happen if you do this and this and that. They're not going to learn by that way. They're not going to learn by an algorithm. So I better show them what's going to happen to them if they don't behave correctly. This is the consequences that you're going to have to face. So in my mind, that's what Coyote the Animal Person would do. I believe he would have martyred himself and took off and did all these bad decisions to show all of us humans in the future, all of us Kalmuk, this is what happens to you. This is the consequences that you face. You don't get a second life. You don't get a little fox, a Kaluk, jumping over you four times to bring you back to life. I do. That's why I'm going to martyr. That's why I'm going to show you how not to 
behave. That's how, I, in my mind's eye, I picture coyote. Where do you find most of the stories? Lately, I haven't been really researching them too much, but some from James Tate, for sure. Some from uh, other storytellers. We've had a few events over the last few years where we looked at how uh, our stories are made into laws, you know, Suclock McLandon Laws by Ron and Marion Ignis. Then we had another book that we made up at SNTC that had a big focus group. And then uh, SFU had a, had a research project, and uh, they talked about traditional governance and things like that and how our, how our stories played a role in traditional governance. And uh, I just listen to the other storytellers and I hear their stories and and they share them sometimes I'll hear a story just once and then for no known reason like maybe five years later four years later I'll be sitting around and all of a sudden that story will go pop in my mind and I'll go wow that'd be a great story to tell at this event so I'll go out and I'll find that that person who told that story originally and I'll ask them hey can I can I share that story and they they might say yeah so other storytellers, James Tate, other books, wherever I can, really. But I, I always try to make sure that they're from the Suklak Makulu and try to make sure that I uh, at least uh, have some provenance of uh, acceptance to be able to, to share them, some permission at some level that I can, I can share them. Yeah, I, I know that permission is it's so important. And I've heard you talk about this before, so it's interesting. What is your feeling on sharing the stories? There's a few stories that I'll share over and over and over. And I, I, I have no qualms about them because they've been published so many times by some of the ancestors of the Sikwak Makulu. And they've been published so many times in books and textbooks and here and there. And I see them, see them all over the place. So I don't have no qualms about sharing those stories, you know, such as Bear and Coyote Make Day and Night, How Bear Lost His Tail. There's a couple other ones that are what I call community stories. You know, they've been around the way so many times that they become community stories. But then there are other stories that I only heard once, or maybe it was published in a book for a reason to help give the description of our laws or help with our description of uh, traditional governance or something like that. And I'll, I'll read that story and I'll see who told it. And if I really, really want to tell that story, I'll go to that person and I'll ask them. I'll just simply ask them. I'll say, I'll, I'll hand them a little pouch of tobacco or whatever medicines I might have. And I'll go and as, I'll tell them beforehand what, I, what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, I saw your story in a book. I want to come to ask you for permission. And I want to do it in person because I want to offer you. And uh, um, I'll go to them and I'll put a little offering in their hand and I'll I'll ask them, is that, is that a good enough offering? Do you need Skalout? Do you need this? Do you need, you know, a Timmy's card? <laughs> you know, what do you need? And then I'll ask their permission. I'll simply say, can I, can I tell it? Can you tell it how I can tell it? That's what I'll say sometimes. And if it's going to be different from in the book, then I'll tell it how they told it. And I won't record it. I won't write any notes. I'll listen. And that way, it's truly me telling the way that I remember that they told it. So that way, if there's something I missed in the way that they told it to me, then that was meant to be. That was the way it was meant to be, is the way, my thinking. That the way that I retold it as the way they told it to me, if I miss like the whole middle part and I only tell the, the beginning and the end and I miss the big middle part, and then someone comes up and goes, hey, you missed that whole middle part, you know, remember from the book? And I'll say, mm, well, I guess that was the way it was meant to be. I'm only telling it the way I was told. So then that way, it's mine. I, I make it mine for that sharing. And after that, if I, if I don't have permission to tell, retell it again, I won't tell it again. If I tell them that I'm only going to tell it for this one event and this is what it's for, you know, maybe I'm going to meet with a bunch of like uh, students who are, you know, who are in trouble, you know, who are troubled, so-called troubled youth. And they need to hear a story about this boy who, who gets in trouble with the flesh eaters. And I... I I retell it the way that the guy tells it and I missed parts of it, then I just consider that that's the way it was meant to be. 
and I told everything that I need that needed to be told within that moment. I'll ask him, is that, is that a good enough offering? Do you need Skalout? Do you need this? Do you need, you know, a Timmy's card? I just want to mention we are not sponsored by Tim Hortons. But if you ever want to bring Kenton out for a telling, feel free to offer him a Timmy's card. And if you're listening, Tim Hortons, and you'd like to support a podcast, we're available. <laughs>